very good evening and welcome. You're watching the 7 o'clock news here on CNC3. I'm Maria Rambley. Kamal has the evening off. Let's tell you what's making the news tonight. The rate at which we're dropping has, has diminished tremendously, which could signal basically what we call a turnaround. We're changing direction. COVID cases increasing steadily. Health officials tell us what's causing the spike and what needs to be done. With dozens of staff members in quarantine, the Presbyterian board says students are without teachers. Tattoo artist finds two men with gunshot wounds outside his home. Both men die at hospital. Good evening, I'm Ryan Beichu. Here's what's coming up in sport. As creditors line up, Minister Shamfa Kojo reaffirms the government's position they will not help clear the TTFA debt. It was a day of thunderstorms, flooding, and even an earthquake. Join me, Kalein Hussein, because we have lots to talk about in tonight's weather forecast. As relatives were saying their final farewell to 62-year-old Sita Jagasa today, homicide detectives were preparing to charge a close female relative for her murder. Police sources attached to the investigation confirm they have received instructions from the Deputy Director of Public Prosecutions to proceed with charges for Jagasa's murder. The mother of four was discovered on the floor of her home at her Clarkia Drive Wellington Road home last Tuesday by her 13-year-old granddaughter. An autopsy revealed that she suffered blunt force trauma injuries and was strangled. CNC3 News understands the 35-year-old relative has been in custody since last week. During her funeral service in San Fernando today, a pastor read a tribute from one of Jagas's three daughters. She stood with us from childhood until womanhood. I have lost my rock, my strength, my corrector, and most of all, my mother. She was my guidance and all those the female relative is to appear virtually before a magistrate tomorrow. A 29-year-old Diego Martin man is no longer wanted as a murder suspect in the shooting death of PC Clarence Jilks. Homicide investigators confirm the Diego Martin man, who was originally believed to be responsible for Jilks' death, is now a potential witness in the investigation. A post-mortem report concluded Jilks died from a single gunshot wound to the back of his head. However, there is no confirmation on what type of bullet was recovered. The official police report claimed that Jilks was killed by gunmen, but residents in the community claim he was accidentally killed by one of his own colleagues. The man is yet to turn himself in to assist with the investigation. One of his relatives tells CNC3 News that he will do so in time. But questions are now being asked what recourse would be available as he was placed in the public domain as a criminal. Speaking to CNC3 News, Acting Police Commissioner McDonald Jacob confirmed that all guns involved in the shooting has been seized and some officers are on sick leave. He could not ascertain why the officers approached the Diego Martin man. I want to give the assurance that after the investigation is completed by the investigators, um, whatsoever action needs to be taken will be taken. But we, the, the, we know in the middle of the investigation, and it is difficult now to conclude with as relates to anything at all. We have to just continue doing the work that we are doing. I will need to, I, I will need to accept that, the, um, yeah, I will need to, um, I know that's about warrant because um, that is knowledge to me, that is news to me in relation to that aspect. Well, we'll have more on this developing story as we wait for the potential witness to come forward. The effects of the long Easter weekend and the reopening of schools could see this country soon recording up to 1,000 COVID cases a day. The warning comes from the health minister as the average number of daily cases rise by 85% in the last two weeks. But while he says the increase was expected, he warns that behaviors need to change. Rashad Khan has more in this report. As restrictions lifted in time for the long Easter weekend, there were concerns about whether this would worsen the current outbreak. And now, the suspicions have been confirmed as COVID-19 cases are continuing on an upward trajectory. 24% increase in Epi Week 15 to 16, 
with a possible 30% increase by this weekend. So and according to Epidemiology Division Technical Director Dr. Avery Hines, while monthly cases have been decreasing since December, April is on track to break that trend. He says this month is set to record almost as many cases as last month. The rate at which we're dropping has has diminished tremendously, which could signal basically what we call a turnaround, we're changing direction. While those figures are enough to raise alarms, the minister says the real fear is what lies ahead. In 14 days, we move from a rolling seven-day average of 238 to 440. If we continue like this, Dr. Hines, we go back to the days of 700, 800, 900 cases per day, which is where we don't want to go. The minister says reintroducing restrictions is not being considered at this time. He says the population needs to be more responsible. But while cases are on the rise, he says the ministry is focusing on the number of hospitalizations. So our hospital system and the ability to provide that care is not being compromised at this point in time. But we continue to watch it, and that is why it is so important, and don't want to sound like a stock record, but I have to, that the population understands this and works with us by everybody, every individual, family, organization doing your personal risk assessment. Dr. Hines says the return to physical classes is just one of the contributors to the increase. He says it's the entire loosening of restrictions that is responsible for it. As cases rise, Professor Christine Carrington says the more infectious Stella Omicron subvariant appears to be the dominant strain in the country. However, her assessment was a guarded one. She says this is because of the low number of samples being submitted for sequencing of recent. Rashad Khan, CNC3 News. With over 100 students and close to 40 teachers in quarantine, the Presbyterian Board is calling on the Health Ministry to prioritize testing for schools. Its chairman says the number of cases has been rising across its 72 primary schools, and now the board is seeking help from the Education Ministry to fill the gap. Bavita Gopolchan explains. Less than two weeks ago, hundreds of students eagerly walked into classrooms after two years. But already, some have been forced back home. Chairman of the Presbyterian Primary School Board, Vikram Ramlal, tells CNC3 News, 35 students across its 72 schools have tested positive, while an additional 103 are in quarantine. And the staff members are also affected. We have four principals who are in quarantine, two are positive, two are primary contacts, 16 teachers who tested positive. And we have a further 24 teachers who are in quarantine, either waiting results or uh, primary contacts. Admitting that the rising cases is posing a challenge, Ramlal is now seeking the intervention of the Minister of Health. The Ministry of Health makes some provision so that students, whether primary or secondary, who test positive and are in need of medical attention, be given some priority. We also proposing that the Ministry of Health, where we have children and teachers and principals tested, that priority be given to having those results done so the shortest possible time. Ramlal says the board is seeking supplemental staff through the Education Ministry to ensure that learning continues since they don't believe there is need to revert to online classes. The board is urging parents to stop sending children to school if they are not well. We are having a few cases of that happening and it is placing a great stress on our staff when they are screening students entering the school. He said there have been cases where parents have sent their children to school despite being in quarantine. Meanwhile, Michael Cooper Ocheng, PCTT communications manager, denied claims that schools are hiding COVID cases. He explained that schools are guided by a policy which ensures privacy of students and staff. Bavita Gopal Chan, CNC3 News. To some other news now, it was the third consecutive day of floods across the country with more traffic headaches. Colleen Hussein is standing by with the latest. Colleen. Rhea, after a day of rain across Trinidad and Tobago, we usually see three things. Subsiding floodwaters after rainfall ends, and we saw that on the Solomon Hochoy Highway near Freeport as floodwaters cross northbound lanes. But it also caused some traffic delays because of something else, caused hydroplaning on floodwaters and running off the road, which caused quite a bit of traffic delays on the northbound lanes. But on the southbound lanes, significant traffic delays occurred. And if you're heading out of Port of Spain and down south, 
Now, something else that was pretty typical was that hydroplaning cause today. So another one of those uh, at the Uriah Butler Highway in Mount Hope, where a three-ton truck ran off the road into floodwaters. So when you encounter heavy rainfall or even floodwaters slow down or even better, turn around, don't drown. But as heavy rainfall impacted the country, we saw other damage like this tree being downed at the Maracas St. Joseph uh, Valley today following a lightning strike. And that tree fell across uh, someone's property. Thankfully, no injuries reported there. But we did see quite a bit of flooding in that Maracas St. Joseph Valley as water came down steep slopes uh, in that area. And unfortunately, that led to the rising of the uh, St. Joseph River, rather, in the Maracas St. Joseph Valley, and that caused some flooding lower down on the Eastern Main Road and the priority bus route that left quite a bit of debris strewn across the road. But as we head through today, we saw flooding across many parts of the country, including uh, Aranguez, down south in Woodlands, Freeport, uh, Chaguanas, and even up north in Dago Martin, the Queens Park, Savannah, Lady Young Road, you name it, there was flooding today, mainly across western parts of Trinidad. You can see some more flood video here on Saddle Road in Maraval, but can we see more rainfall? Well, I'll have those details later in the newscast, but just a sneak peek, the answer is looking like yes. Back to you. Thank you so much, Colleen. Still to come in the 7 p.m. news. After HEC asked them to build houses, small and medium contractors are yet to be paid, some on the verge of bankruptcy. An inmate is battling cancer that's destroying his face, but relatives say his wait for surgery is almost as long as a wait for justice. There will be a delay in this year's administration of the CXC exams. The announcement was made today by CXC's registrar and CEO, Dr. Wayne Wesley, following a special meeting of CXC's School Examinations Committee and its council earlier in the day. Wesley said CXC considered the impact that COVID-19 had on the education system overall and the readiness of students to write exams at this time. Candidates registered to write CAPE, CSEC, and the Caribbean Certificate of Secondary Level Competence have also been given other concessions. Extension of the submission of school-based assessment from the June 30, 2022, by a further two weeks for the submission of both CAPE and CSEC SBAs. And thirdly, that the release of broad topics be communicated to the candidates. CXC exams are scheduled to commence on May 23rd, with results projected to be released in late August or early September. And for those candidates who encounter challenges prior to the exams or who may contract COVID-19, CXC noted that deferral is still an option. The Division of Education in Tobago will audit the financials of three denominational schools on the island, which received THA funding. Education Secretary Zorisha Hackett says when she took office in December, she met plans in place to provide almost $640,000 a term to the Pentecostal Light and Life Foundation High School. But the school's board announced last week it would be closing, saying it did not receive THA's assistance to reopen. But Hackett says funds were released and the board does not have the authority to close the school. What happened last Friday, we cannot continue along this way. And so the Pentecostal Light and Life Foundation High School, just as our other two denominational schools, will have to be audited. A general auditing of the THA is currently on its way, and we are going to add these denominational schools to the free. The division says so far it sent fans to the school and serviced air-conditioned units. Assistant Secretary Kerr says they were replacing units that were irreparable. He says the uh, division is also addressing plumbing and electrical issues. Now, no matter how desperate they become, home construction contractors say they will never work for the state again. The small and medium-sized contractors were hired by the Housing Development Corporation to build affordable homes. But some say they aren't being paid for the work they've done. Some are facing bankruptcy, while others had to furlough staff as they wait on the HDC to fulfill outstanding invoices. So what is the Housing Ministry doing to address this? Akash Samaru tells us in this story. 
The SMC initiative had good intentions. Instead of the big companies getting every slice of the pie, this gave small and medium contractors a chance to earn some money as well. Upon employment of these smaller contractors, they in turn give work to your licensed neighborhood plumber or mason. How it works is that the HDC would issue a contract and the SMCs would use some of their own capital to get started. During the course of building homes, the HDC would send people during the various phases of construction to check the quality of work. And then within a month, they're supposed to cut the contractor check. Now, now we say supposed to, because according to some contractors, that system worked probably one time and then never again. Now, the contractors asked to be kept anonymous because they say in their line of work, going public gets you blacklisted. Contractor 1 told us that payments have been inconsistent and late, sometimes four months late. And now over time, the HDC owes him close to $1.3 million. He told CNC3 News, right now I am almost bankrupt and I have children to send to school. Right now I don't have any workers. I laid off everyone and whenever they pay me, then I'll take who is available back to work. Another contractor said the HDC has just over $700,000 for him from when he was selected to build four townhouses. The contractor said, I cannot start my private projects to grow my company because the banks won't give me any more money until I pay what is owed. I can't do that unless the HDC pays me. Some contractors say they're not doing anything for the state again after this bad experience. Which is disheartening for all, considering the HDC would have enlisted the help of the private sector to accelerate construction so that there'd be more homes for the public to get. Right, so we reached out to the HDC and they apologize for what they're calling the unintentional delay in payments. The corporation said over the past year they've had some serious revenue issues, but they're trying to sort that out. In the meantime, they'll be reaching out to those contractors within the next month to organize a payment plan. So we'll monitor that. Akash Samaru, CNC3 News. Thank you so much, Akash. Now, the Ministry of Trade and Industry is tonight confirming that it is in the process of reviewing this country's legislative and policy frameworks to understand the possibilities for a cryptocurrency sector in TNT. The Trade Ministry says while there is no policy position at this time, the ongoing review will allow for the appropriate regulations and systems related to crypto mining being developed. This announcement comes on the heels of conglomerate Anse Macau and two international companies proposing a Bitcoin mining farm at the Tamina Intech Park. The journey to home ownership is sometimes a long one. And because it is a long journey, you have to find the right financial partner to help you along the way. In tonight's Business Watch, RAND Credit Union tells us some integral questions you need to ask that prospective partner. The following Business Watch feature is brought to you by Rand's Credit Union Cooperative Society Limited. So you've made up your mind. You're finally ready to buy your new home. You found the perfect place, you know the cost, and you have Googled what you think you need to know about the process. But what comes next? It's advice that I, I, I received and I, I would give it. Being prepared is the most advantage position you can put yourself in. It can start with a search. But it should not end unless you do research. And for research, you should go to the respective firm that you see is you're interested in, who seems the most viable, who responded to you, and who is able to partner with you relationship-wise in this journey, because it is going to be a long one if you're looking at home ownership. What are some of the questions you should ask when you do go to speak to the financial institution? An important question can help is things like the interest rate. Is it fixed? Is it variable? You know, uh, some institutions marketed based on the interest rate, but they don't identify if it's fixed or variable. But what exactly is the difference? For the fixed interest rate, it doesn't change over the life of your loan, particularly since it's on a reducing balance. So whatever your balance is reduced, the interest rate goes at that fixed rate, as opposed to if it's a variable interest rate, if it increases, it affects your principal balance. So your interest rate would be higher. Same, even though your installment doesn't change with both, you're paying more over time. Joel Julian, CNC3 Business Watch. The preceding Business Watch feature was brought to you by Rand's Credit Union Cooperative Society Limited. 
In a quick update, current matters of foreign policy, national security and energy issues with some of the topics discussed today by Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley. Dr. Rowley, according to a statement from his office, spent the day on Capitol Hill participating in a series of meetings with members of the U.S. Congress today. The Prime Minister met with several officials. Dr. Rowley will return to Capitol Hill tomorrow where he is expected to meet with U.S. lawmakers. And returning to some crime news, relatives of the two men shot dead in Cuba last night say they're leaving the killers in the hands of God. 24-year-old Malik Harper and 31-year-old John Utram were at Anisha Street when they were ambushed by a gunman. The suspect fired at the men before escaping. Harper's relatives rushed him to the Coover Health Facility while Utram was taken there by police. Both men, however, died while receiving treatment at the Coover Health Facility. Harper's father tells CNC3 News his family has been concerned about the crime situation, but never once did they think it would reach their front steps. To whatever he had done is an innocent man he put on. Right, and I hope I get justice for that. My son now started to live 24 years of age. Mm -hmm. And you just take the life out of my child, yes, so. Harper's father and older sister said he was not involved in any illegal activities. They say he was hoping to join the prison service. Meanwhile, Utram's brother said the family is in grief and did not want to speak about the incident. Police are yet to determine a motive for the murders. But well, still to come in the news, he went from too young to soca to becoming the king of soca. Marshall Montano's life story is documented and will soon be published. Good Wednesday evening, everyone. Across Trinidad and Tobago today, we saw some sunny skies initially with Scott temperatures quite warm during the late morning through the afternoon. Maximum high of 31.9 degrees was recorded at Piaco, a bit cooler across in Tobago with cloud cover. But we will be seeing some warmer temperatures over the next several days as sunshine is expected to return, but not just yet tomorrow. I'll have those details later in the newscast. Welcome back, everyone. The eyes are said to be the window to the soul, but they're often an overlooked part of the body. When it comes to blindness or other vision-related issues, women are more susceptible. So while everyone needs to look after their eyes, women are advised to be extra cautious. Reporter Rashad Khan and cameraman Timothy Shasto tell us more in tonight's Wellness Wednesday. I spy with my little eye some troubling news. According to the World Health Organization, two out of every three people with blindness or visual problems are women. It says one reason is because women typically live longer than men, meaning they are more prone to age-related issues. Resident ophthalmologist at the Eye Hospital, Dr. Saretta Duby, says it's not just elderly women at risk. Even our younger women might be prone to developing certain eye conditions. So that would include, um, for example, if they're pregnant or if they're on the hormone replacement therapy, even being on cancer therapy, or certain uh, oral contraceptive pills might predispose them to ocular conditions. Women have a higher prevalence of vision problems, which includes age-related macular degeneration, cataract, dry eye, glaucoma, low vision, thyroid eye disease, and refractive error. And given the country's high prevalence of non-communicable diseases, Dr. Duby says women here are also presenting with additional issues. Any kind of um, systemic comorbidity that's related to metabolic disease, so that would be diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, those would cause um, most commonly bleeding towards the back of the eyes, even um, clots to the back of the eye or what we call strokes within the eye. She says because of the country's large Afro population, there is also a high incidence of glaucoma, but there is good news. She says these conditions can be combated through education and regular screening. Letting um, women be aware of the possible conditions that could affect the eye in certain groups. So that would be the first thing, and I think moving from there, um, routine and regular eye checks would be the way forward, because that way we are able to pick up any kind of eye conditions before they start to cause any particular problems. Much like any other medical condition, 
She says early detection means early treatment, which in turn can guarantee a better outcome. Rashad Khan, CNC3 News. The mother of an inmate of, at the maximum security prison is calling on the authorities to allow him to have surgery. 35-year-old Brent Morgan is currently on remand for almost three years. During that time, he developed a tumor on the right side of his face. The inmate's mother told us her son has not been able to get the surgery. She says he has been on antibiotics and painkillers. It has been discovered 2019. Now it's 2022. They has been giving him antibiotics and painkillers for two years and a half. NC3 News understands that Brent Morgan is currently at the Mount Hope Hospital. She says the tumor has now destroyed his jaw. Efforts to contact the prison's commissioner on this issue proved futile as all calls went unanswered. <laughs> Joining us once again is Kaleen Hussein and Kaleen, we could have anticipated the heavy downpours, the macro traffic and the flash flooding, but then the earthquake hit. Right, I mean, you, we can't predict earthquakes, but this week just had so many of them. This one was the third felt earthquake in the last three days. So let's take a look at what's going on earthquake-wise. You know, the UE Seismic Research Center calculated the one that hit at 535 today at a magnitude 5.1 preliminary. So that means the depth, the magnitude, and even the location can change. But over the last three days, we've had a magnitude 4.2 on the Paria Peninsula yesterday. And we also had a magnitude 4.4 that hit near San Fernando early Monday morning. Now, none of these earthquakes are connected. It's another reminder we live in a seismically active area, so you should know what, you sh what to do in the event a larger earthquake hits, which is to drop, cover, and hold out the shaking and assess the environment afterwards. And talking about assessing the environment, let's take a look at what's going on in the atmosphere because we still have unstable weather across Trinidad and Tobago. The Met Office has discontinued that adverse weather alert. It's now at green level, but we still can see some showers and even some isolated thunderstorms tomorrow so what we have right now is that shear line that frontal shear line attached to a powerful non-tropical low pressure system all the way in the north atlantic and that's what caused the light winds to occur across trinidad and tobago lots of moisture to move from the southeast and cause all of the inclement weather we've seen over the last three days but something is going to be changing tomorrow and that is saharan dust we've enjoyed good air quality over the last several days but saharan and us will be moving in from the Atlantic across Trinidad and Tobago, bringing some drier conditions, but we still have a relatively unstable atmosphere. So looking at the forecast for us overnight tonight, Variably cloudy skies, we still could see one or two isolated showers favoring Tobago as well as eastern parts of Trinidad. Isolated thunderstorm activity will generally remain offshore, so that means you can still see lightning, just thankfully no heavy rainfall overnight. Minimum low temperatures around 23 to 24 degrees. And for tomorrow, keep the umbrellas with you. Sensitive groups also keep uh, your necessary medications because we will have Saharan dust as well as some rain and even the possibility of thunderstorms. Starting off the morning, variably cloudy with the one or two isolated showers that means you'll still see some sunshine mixed in there but as we head through the late morning through the afternoon just like today we'll see those clouds build and by the afternoon overcast conditions with isolated thunderstorms generally favoring eastern parts of Trinidad uh, sorry western parts of Trinidad rather so that's where we're watching out for more localized street flooding maximum high temperatures tomorrow getting up to around 31 to 32 degrees as we end tomorrow overcast conditions with light rain possible and conditions are forecast to settle into the evening and if you are heading to the beaches tomorrow even though it's not advised with all the rain in sheltered areas waves are near calm occasionally choppy during heavier showers or thunderstorms in open waters still slight to moderate with waves between 1 to 1.5 meters uh, we do have some long period swells coming in tomorrow and winds will be picking up this weekend agitating seas so take that into consideration with your beach plans if you are looking to head to the beach this weekend what weather can you expect well the atmosphere will be drying out into the weekend we'll be breezy by Saturday with one or two isolated showers but come Sunday into Monday really sunny conditions retain we're going to be feeling that dry season weather because it's still not the wet season just yet Ria thank you so much Colleen so the Saharan dust will be entering the chat tomorrow yes thankfully and it'll be keeping the floods away fingers crossed and thank you so much for that reminder that in 
you know, times of an earthquake, it's important to drop and cover. That's an important reminder for those in our newsroom. Yeah, it's not actually. running out of the building. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Thank you so much, Colleen. Well, let's tell you what's still to come in the news. The Rotary Club of San Fernando South honors several unsung heroes for service to country. Among them, a CNC3 member you've come to know and love. The United States Embassy is promising scores of jobs as it seeks to build a new state-of-the-art and eco-friendly building. In a statement today, the Public Affairs section said the U.S. Department of State was discussing the relocation of the U.S. Embassy currently located at Queen's Park West, Port of Spain. Once it decides on a site, the U.S. Embassy will issue a statement. The Embassy says the project is important and exciting as there are numerous benefits it will also allow them to serve their constituents better, improve applicants' experience, and provide new and improved facilities and services for those conducting business with the U.S. government. The embassy says the project is an indicator of the U.S. government's commitment to a long-standing and robust relationship with the people and government of Trinidad and Tobago. The Rotary Club of San Fernando South is honoring eight people from various walks of life for their service to this country. Among them is CNC3's senior cameraman Ivan Tulsi. Ivan has covered thousands of groundbreaking stories throughout his 30-year career in media. Referring to Ivan and the other seven recipients as unsung heroes, the club thanked them for their contribution during an award service on a Tuesday night. Unsung heroes represent the best of who we can be. They demonstrate extraordinary courage, compassion, and sacrifice without ever seeking a recognition. Their efforts serve as powerful examples of how to make a positive difference in the world. Also receiving awards were San Fernando Mayor Junior Agrello, Joel Rahim, Boise Bim Lala, Kenneth Surat, Nicole Peel, Eka McPhee, and David Bukal. We just want to say congratulations to our very own Ivan Tosi from all of us here at CNC3. It's time to recap our headlines as we leave you. With dozens of staff members in quarantine, the Presbyterian Board says students are without teachers. Tattoo artist finds two men with gunshot wounds outside his home. Both men die at hospital. This is where we leave you on behalf of the entire news team. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Ria Rambley. Have a good night.